Glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So today is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, and it's a, it's a good thing to kind of review what this season of Epiphany might mean for us. Uh, we we in the in the world know major seasons of the church calendar, and you know we all know about Christmas, and we know that Christmas isn't just one day, but it's actually uh, one day that begins and then ends two weeks later, uh, in after the second uh, Sunday of Christmas. Then we also know about Easter, which is not just one day, but it has actually six Sundays in uh, the season. And so we know those, and many people out of the world might know a little bit about Pentecost. Uh, we might know that that is a long, long season that uh, is a day that we that begins a day of just wonderful celebration, but that lasts for maybe twenty weeks, twenty Sundays over the summer. But many people might not really know much about Epiphany. Epiphany happens, you know, after the Christmas season, and, and, and they usually associate Epiphany with uh, those wise men, those wise men coming down and, and, and seeing the, the, this, this Jesus, this God who comes in the form of this Jesus, this baby. And we imagine that Epiphany is a time in which God reveals God's self. And it, it is true. During this whole season of Epiphany, which lasts about six Sundays, we are given readings that cause us to think about truths that are powerful, truths that are made open and clear by Jesus as Jesus interacts with his world. And those truths are just as important for us as God interacts with us in our world. These truths, these openings for us are just powerful. I love that word, powerful. Yes, I, I've said it many times. But let me give you a definition of epiphany from the uh, Oxford Dictionary. It says, a sudden intuitive perception into the reality or essential meaning of something, usually initiated by some simple, homely, or commonplace occurrence or experience. Some commonplace occurrence and experience. We celebrate the epiphany, and when we celebrate it, we celebrate it because it shows us a new pattern a new truth about us, out of something that we already have seen for so long, in something that is already a part of our lives. How many of you, when you have had these epiphany moments in your lives, and you have, each one of you have had moments of deep clarity, a, a, a light bulb almost goes off in your head, and you see something that you've, you've always seen, but then all of a sudden it becomes a new truth is revealed to you. That's an epiphany. And in the season of epiphany, we are celebrating all those moments of truth that come to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Jesus interacts with the people of God. And we see something new. And we're cut to the heart because that truth is so real that it changes the pattern of our lives. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, Jesus could be, I like to think of Jesus as the man of epiphany. He's always giving us epiphanies. Wherever we go in the scripture, there's always something new and wonderful about God and God's relationship to us and our relationship to people and how we deal with people around us that we can learn in those interactions. You all remember, it, I know that all of you read the Bible. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, we do. We listen to the Bible every Sunday, and we also look at, uh, listen, do our morning prayer and evening prayer, and we do the study on the Bible too. And these, you remember the stories. Remember the story of Jesus with that, uh, 
that Pharisee Nicodemus coming out in the middle of the night? Jesus, he comes to Jesus and Jesus uh, uh, talks to him. And all of a sudden, this, this man, this PhD, this wonderful, uh, wonderfully educated man of law, all of a sudden says, how do I become born again? How do I become new again? How do I feel the freshness of life again? How do I engage God the way I used to again? And Jesus says, you must be born of the Holy Spirit. Or remember that, that, that wonderful, sassy woman at the well who, uh, who's, who's there bringing, pour, getting some water out of the well in the Gospel of John. And, she, and Jesus approaches her and he says, you want some water from me? <laughs> And he goes, yes, I want some water for you. And then, and then she talks about all the love she had, all the, 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 the missteps and all the relationships she has. And then he says, yes, I know you've been married five times and you're with the, the guy right now that you're with and I know you're looking for love. <laughs> and then Jesus says, I can give you something that you're really yearning for. True love, true living water. Oh, oh! Remember that that wonderful story of that uh, rich young. I call him fool. He's really a rich young man. He's, he doesn't say he's fool, but I think of him as a rich young fool. And I used to think of myself as him for a while. I'm no longer. I'm no longer. Well, I'm not rich, nor I am I young. So <laughs> I think the last that connection might be me. But the rich young fool, all of a sudden his life is, 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 has, been, has been with this one goal of succeeding, of doing everything right, of, of being perfect. He's followed the letter of the law and he is successful, he's rich, he's amazing, everybody loves him. But there's something inside of him that's empty and Jesus says, listen, I know you're good. You're great, but I want you to give up everything and follow me. And the rich young man is cut to the heart and he knows that this is the one thing, his success, his idea of success is what's holding him back from truly rev reveling in the power of God. And so he turns away and walks. Yes, Jesus is a man of epiphanies. Every time he meets with somebody, every time he talks with somebody, there's something that is open about God and the world and that person and that person's relationship to the world. Today is no different. Today, as Jesus goes home, he goes home to Nazareth. And Nazareth in the gospel story today is, is uh, uh, the place that he was brought up. And, and, and I'll tell you, we look with fondness on Nazareth. And we look at this, this passage and we look at Nazareth and we say, oh my God, this is where God was, was nurtured. Oh my, this must be a beautiful, holy place. And yes, it is honored as holy now. But at that time, at that time, that town was considered a backwater town. At that time, that Nazareth was way off the beaten path of anything that's cosmopolitan. In fact, Jesus left Nazareth to go live in Galilee, in Capernaum, where there was more interaction with all the world. And he goes out there and does miracles in Capernaum, but in Nazareth he could do nothing. Why? Well, when he came back to Nazareth, people said, wow, a hometown boy. This is, this is the guy that we raised up. Look at how he's done. We're good, aren't we? And then he, he comes to them, and they're, all, they're very proud of him, of course. And he reads from the scriptures. And it, the scriptures are powerful. And he talks about his commission to do good in the world, about his mission. And they look at him, and they say, God, we're good. God, we're good. And then, all of a sudden, they start to remember, wait a second, you know, he speaks with such authority, but, you know, listen, he's the son of Joseph. 
and Mary, we know him. And then they start questioning in their minds about what he's saying. He sees this, and then he throws something to them. He goes, listen, I know you folks are kind of conservative. I know that you folks are kind of uh, scared a little bit. And I know you folks don't like all those different people. But remember, God works among all people. And so he tells them, listen, there is, remember the prophet Elijah. Prophet Elijah didn't just work miracles in Israel. The prophet Elijah also worked to provide salvation for the widow of Zarephath, a Gentile, someone who was a foreigner. And remember, remember the prophet Elisha. And Elisha was a great prophet, and he said, and, and he did miracles in Israel, but remember also that great Syrian general, Naaman, Naaman who had leprosy. Well, the prophet Elisha cured his leprosy. And not all the people of Israel. Now, this irked those Nazareth folk. Because they said, God is only for them. And so, they start getting angry. And they, they push him out of the, 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 the temple, the synagogue. They, they push him out. Imagine how far it would be from the center of the town out to the edges of the town and to bring Jesus out to a cliff. They must have been pushing him for a long time. Angry. They were angry. And they kept pushing and pushing and pushing until finally they're on that cliff and he turns around. And folks, I think they had an epiphany moment. They looked directly at their favorite son and then realized what they were doing. They were about to kill their favorite son. This man who could do so many great things and they were cut to the heart with the truth that was powerful. And Jesus turned around and walked right through them. In order to have epiphany moments, I think, you have to be humble. You can't be full of yourself. You can't be in a, in, in, and you can't be full of pride, saying that you know already. It's, the epiphany moments are there because we are Cloudy. We are spiritually blind to what is ahead of us, in front of us. <clears throat> those epiphany moments happen when God takes those blinders off. But you have to be humble to receive it. The readings all point to that. All of the readings today point to a certain humility of heart and mind in order for God to break through. This uh, Wednesday in Bible study, we uh, with Wednesday in Bible study, we also go over these lessons and Bible study. If you have never been to Bible study at our church, please come. Just come. Just sit at one time and, and and have the Bible opened up to you. But we look over the readings for this the, the coming Sunday, and we also look over on uh, those same readings on Wednesday morning. And one of our parishioners, actually a warden in fact, Betsy, thought of something that was really interesting. She, she was watching the movie Gandhi. And in Gandhi, uh, there was this one scene that she uh, was watching and she, uh, she stopped it there because it was kind of upsetting. There's a scene in which uh, there, uh, the, the movie depicts an action that happened in India around 1919. And it's when, uh, you know, the, the revolution, there was a, a, there was a in, in India, there was, a, there was anger that was brewing. There was almost a sense of, of revolution that was happening. And Gandhi was 
trying to make it a non-violent revolution, but, uh, but other people were, were trying to incite anger. And of course, the, uh, the British rulers at the time, in the Viceroy, made some acts to say, look, don't gather, you cannot gather together in, in groups because we're scared of the insurrection. And so, prior to this 1919, there was a, uh, in April of 1919, there was an act that said no one should gather together and anyone could be arrested at any time if there was any sense of treason in uh, that, in that group. And so, in Amritsar, Amritsar, in Punjab, uh, the colonel there, Colonel, um, what's his name again? Colonel Reginald Dwyer. Reginald Dwyer commanded a troop of people, about 39 people, and the act just came into session, or into active, uh, became active, and then all of a sudden, there were, well not all of a sudden, these people were gathering for a religious ceremony. And as they were gathering for a religious ceremony, they didn't hear anything about the act, the Roland Act. And as they were gathering together and worshiping, as they'd done for hundreds of years, Reginald Dwyer brings a troop of men with guns, with machine guns and trucks, to the place where they were gathered in Amisar. And he wasn't able to get the guns through, but his but his troops went through, and they sat there. There were over 3,000 people gathered. And what he did was, without announcing anything, he got them into formation, and then he started shooting at them. Winston Churchill, when he spoke to the House of Commons debate in July 8, 1920, said the crowd was unarmed, except with bludgeons. It was not attacking anybody or anything. When fire had been opened upon it, it dispersed it. It tried to run away, pinned up in a narrow place, considerably smaller than Trafalgar Square, with hardly any exits, and packed together so that one bullet could drive through three or four bodies. The people ran madly this way and the other way. When the fire was directed upon the center, they ran to the sides. The fire was then directed to the sides. Many threw themselves down on the ground. The fire was then directed down on the ground. This was continued for eight to 10 minutes, and it stopped only when the ammunition had reached the point of exhaustion. 1,050 bullets killing 1,016 people, injuring or putting 300 into the hospital, wounded. Immediately afterwards, there was a, a court case in the, uh, and the colonel was presented to the viceroy, and the boy, viceroy asked, well, Colonel Dwyer, why did you do this? They broke the law. <clears throat> Well, why didn't you warn them about your firing? Why didn't you give, a chance, give them a chance to disperse? They knew the law, they broke the law. Well, Colonel, what about, why did you, why did you, why did you shoot the people on the side when they were trying to escape? They broke the law. Well, Colonel, what about those wounded people that were there? Did you offer any help to them? They knew the law. If they wanted help, I would have, they would have asked for it. <clears throat> and a final question. Colonel, how can a three-year-old who just lost her mother ask for help? In the movie, wonderfully acted, there was an epiphany moment in that man's face. Reality cut to truth. Reality became the truth for him. 
epiphany moments. We have them. We have them because we come here to have them, to train our minds about what is really real. How do we really act toward one another? What are we really concerned about? May you, my friends, be filled with God's Holy Spirit. May God open your minds and your hearts to the epiphanies that happen here. And then from here, may you take it out into the world to bring the light of God out there. Amen.